Lists are the first collection that we'll look at in detail, and they're a lot like arrays in that they're an ordered sequence of elements. But there's a few differences between lists and arrays, and here are the key ones. If you're using lists, you're using a method rather than the subscript brackets to get elements in a list. A list is going to track its own logical size, in other words, the number of elements that are in it at this moment, and its physical size, means the total number of cells that are available. Now, also in contrast to arrays, when you first make a list, the list's logical size is zero. And as you insert more elements into it, the list updates its own logical size and it adds new actual physical cells uh, if they're necessary. Likewise, when you remove an element, the logical size is updated then as well. The list interface itself has a ton of methods. These are some of the most common ones. Some of them come from the collection interface and some are specific to the list interface. The get, set, and the first add and remove methods are all index based. So that means that those methods, they use a specific index position in the list to do whatever we're asking them to do. Now this second remove method and the, the index of method, those are element based. So that means they search for a particular element in the list in order to do whatever we want. This last add method also looks to be potentially element based, but it turns out it's not. All it does is it adds a new element to the end of the list. I highly recommend pause the video right now, take a look through some of these methods, and actually it would be wise, Google the list interface itself so you can see uh, the full range of other methods that are available to you if you're working with a list. So go ahead, pause the video and take a look. Now before we go on, we gotta note one thing. These methods in the list interface are all showing an element type named E, or maybe object, and those indicate that the element type is generally an object of some kind or other. Now you might remember earlier we said lists can have elements of any type, but they're constrained in that a list has to have elements of a single type, and we specify what that type is when we instantiate the list object. So when we use a name like E, to specify the type in an interface, we call it a type variable. And then later, when we're actually making a list and we, in place of E, put, say, string, if we want to make a collection full of strings, then we call that a type parameter. We'll learn a ton more about this in the future as the generics, so we'll, we'll, we'll actually formally learn this in a little bit. But first, let's see how we would actually declare and instantiate a list. Now remember, they're objects, so declaring them looks about like what you'd expect, with the one twist that we have to specify what type of thing, what type of element it's going to hold. So here you can see we have to import this uh, the java.util.star, and, and then we declare a list variable called list1, which is going to be a, a list of strings, and then we instantiate an array list object specifically, which also holds strings, and point our list variable at it. Worth noting, list1 is of type list, not array list, and that makes sense, right? Generally, it's our preference to use interface types for variables whenever we can. We've seen that before. So that allows us to change the implementing class in the code. For instance, we could swap out array list for, say, linked list without changing any of the rest of the stuff, as long as we've only used list interface methods, nothing specific to array lists. Also notice that we haven't specified a physical size for the array list like we would have had to for an array. Array lists have a default physical size. I mean, if you really peeked under the hood, you'd see it, but there's no real need for somebody using an array list to know that. And finally, just to really hit it home, you can see that the angle brackets uh, containing string, they specify that this array list is gonna hold strings. You can see the, the generalized syntax for that below here on the last line on this slide. Now remember, these lists are objects, and we're going to use them by calling methods, by sending messages. We have methods to get its logical size, or to test whether it's empty, or to insert, or remove, or get elements, or replace elements at a particular position, or search for a particular element, or a whole bunch of other stuff. If you want to see the full range of what you can do with the list, best bet is to Google the actual official documentation on lists. But let's take a look at a beefier code segment than the one we saw before. Okay, here we're making a new list, list1. Uh, it's an array list, so a list interface variable pointing at an array list object. Here in this first for loop, we're adding one element after another to the list. Looks like we're adding a bunch of strings of the form item and then a number. And then in the next two for loops, we display every element in the list, and we do it in two different ways. 
first way we do it using a traditional for loop uh, with the condition while the loop counter is less than the size. Second time we're using an enhanced for loop because again, lists are collections and collections are iterable. And as long as an object implements the iterable interface, it means we can use an enhanced for loop on it. If we wanted to do some simple searches, well here we can see I've got list and I want to get the index of the string item three. That would show us two. And then same looking for Martin, that's going to show negative one because Martin's not actually in the list that we built in the last slide. And last of all, in this final code chunk, we're saying as long as the list is not empty, remove the very first element, display it, and show the new size of the list after the removal happened. So this is going to go until the list becomes empty. Okay, so lists are powerful, but there's one restriction we have to follow when we're working with them. Now, unlike an array, a list can only have objects, can't use primitive types like ints or doubles. Now we have a workaround and that's essentially to take primitive values and stick them into what we call wrapper classes or, or boxing. In other words, we're wrapping an object around a particular primitive data type. We have to do that because the statement that you see here where we make an array list of ints specifically, this is illegal. We can't actually do that every element in a list has to be an object. As I said before, we'll use what's called a wrapper class to let us store primitive data in lists. A wrapper class is just a class that has a value of a primitive type. And that means we can take a boolean or a care or an int or a double and we can store it in objects of the wrapper class uppercase boolean, uppercase character, uppercase integer, and uppercase double. You've used these classes before, but so far, mostly what you've used them for are their static utility methods like integer.parseInt or character dot get numeric value and uh, other methods like that. So if you take a look at these code segments, you can see how we wrap primitive data into these objects. We've got an integer variable called int object three, and we're making a new integer object with the value three. That gives us an integer object. Uh, you can make one for four as well. And you can see we can then take that integer object and extract its primitive value using the int value method. These objects have well-defined two string methods. Uh, they have equals methods. They have compare to anything you realistically might need in order to work with them. The good news is that generally you don't have to bother with a lot of these little details if you're using primitive types with lists. That's because as of a more recent version of Java, lists automatically box and unbox primitive values whenever you use them with list methods. The only requirement is that you use the correct wrapper class name as the element type whenever you're declaring your list variable and instantiating your list object. You can see it in this example where we manipulate a list of integers. You can see I make a new list, an array list, and I use the wrapper class name here. But now I can, uh, through this for loop, I can iterate my counter from one to 100, and I can just add that int, that primitive int, directly to the list. And Java will handle the automatic boxing of it into the array list for me. And then once I want to actually get a value from that array list of integers, it'll automatically handle the unboxing as well. So I end up, uh, when I call the get method, it automatically gives me an int rather than just giving me the integer object. Again, the reason this works is because the add and set methods automatically box an int value into an integer object and then get automatically unboxes an integer object into an int value. And then if you look at the, the enhanced for loop at the end, that also unboxes every integer object into an int just as we might want. Now, maybe you noticed uh, we used an enhanced for loop in the last slide. And you remember from that hierarchy of collection interfaces, lists implement the collections interface, which implements the iterable interface. So an iterator is any object that lets us visit all the elements in the collection. The simplest kind just supports all the methods in the iterator interface. The has next, which is true or false, is there a next element for us to look at? Uh, next actually gets us the next element and remove takes away the takes away from the collection the element that we most recently returned using next. So suppose I have a collection object. Here let's say I have a list of strings called list one. Well, if I want to open up an iterator on that collection, on that list, I just call the iterator method. And here I'm setting it equal to an iterator variable called iterator object. And it's specified with a type parameter of, uh, of, of string. 
So now you might imagine that the iterator's current position is sort of a pointer that's pointing right before the first object in the collection. So that'd be right before the first string in this array list of strings, as long as the list isn't empty. And now you can check to see, well, is there a next element for me to look at? And if so, then you can proceed through the list, right, using the has next and the next method. This works fairly predictably. You can see it in this example down here. You know, while there is a next object for this iterator to go to, get the object, get that next object, and then do whatever you want with it. In this case, we're printing it out. Has next tells us whether there's a next thing for us to look at, and next actually gets it for us. When the compiler sees you use an enhanced for loop with a collection, this is really what it's doing. It's generating code that just opens up an iterator on the collection and then uses it to do the whole loop that you want to do. So if you think back to the AP image objects, for instance, that you used in the earlier problem set for whodunit uh, for, or foul play, that was an iterable object. Of course, for loops are typically easier to use than iterators. So normally we wouldn't actually explicitly make an iterator. We would just use an enhanced for loop if we wanted to use a traversal. That is, of course, unless we need to remove an element from the collection. As we mentioned earlier, you access things in lists using methods. In arrays, you use subscripts. Now, oftentimes these can get a little confused and beginners would sometimes try to use a subscript with a list or a method with an array. You can see an example of these errors here. I've got an array called array and I've got a list called list. And you can see some syntax errors when I try to use get on the array or when I try to subscript into the list. So now that we've used both arrays and lists, maybe your natural question is, well, which one should I use? Why might we prefer one to the other? They both do the same basic thing, right? They let us store a bunch of elements using some integer index position, and then we can get those and do various things with them. In general, though, lists are way more powerful and way easier to use. The big reasons are just that these things that we like to do, insertion and removal and search and all that, they're built in as methods. So much work is saved for us by using them. And the second massive thing, the value of this cannot be overstated, is that lists track their own size, and they grow however we need them to. We're not trapped into using a list of a particular size if we end up needing something bigger or smaller. Now, I'm not saying that arrays are never the right choice. Sometimes they will be. And in fact, if you peek under the hood of a list, really all you're going to see are arrays. But now that we have lists, uh, there's a good chance that a lot of the things you would have done with arrays beforehand, you'll now do with lists. Okay, all the examples that we've seen so far have been of array lists. The linked list class also implements the list interface, and so whenever you would use an array list, you can also use a linked list if you choose. We'll learn a lot more in detail about the linked list data structure in, in the coming weeks, uh, but the essential idea is this. It's a two-piece data structure where it's essentially a bunch of nodes that are connected one to the other. You've got a head node, and after that, it's just a trail of nodes coming after it, where each node has both a data element and it has a pointer to the next thing in the list. So that, that's, it's, it's like a chain link. Array lists and link lists are logically the same. The only difference is, you know, some runtime performance characteristics. If you're doing something that involves index-based operations, well, typically that's going to be faster with an array list rather than with a linked list. So if you're doing a bunch of stuff like that, you'll want to use an array list if you're going to need to use numerical indices a whole bunch. But we'll get much more closely acquainted with linked lists in the coming weeks. Big ideas before you close up shop. Uh, try writing a method sum that expects a list of integers as its parameter, and it's going to sum them up and return the value. Print all the context in a list using not an enhanced for loop, but rather an, uh, an index-based loop. And write a code segment that uses an iterator to get rid of all the elements 